that the operation of democracy in our country today, as a sociologist, what strikes me most is the contradiction between the ideals of democracy, which are the ideals of equality, and the extremely hierarchical social structure that has come down to us from the past, and many of whose basic components still remain with us. We may have written a constitution which has extensive and detailed provisions for equality, equality of status and equality of opportunity, but the habits of our heart have not changed. It's not simply that there are many inequalities in the distribution of land, in the distribution of income, in the distribution of opportunities. It's not simply that. That is true in, in most large countries. There are inequalities in the distribution of income and wealth and in the distribution of opportunity. But what still continues in India today is that the habits of our heart are basically hierarchical and not democratic. And it's not an easy thing to get over the habits of a hierarchical way of thinking. Dr. Ambedkar had said, democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil which is essentially undemocratic, and we must remember that. He had said, and he had had experience of the deep hierarchies prevalent in rural India as well as in urban India. I think he had suffered from, I think he had had a deeper experience of these hierarchies than either Mahatma Gandhi or Pandit Nehru. He had had a deeper experience of these hierarchies. Because after all, Mahatma Gandhi was born in a fairly privileged family. And uh, much of his life, I mean, he turned to village India after he returned to India as an adult. Whereas Ambedkar had, had known village India and its oppressive social structure from his childhood. And he never, he never forgot about that. So what do we do when we find ourselves in a world in which our uh, basic design of our constitution, of our laws, places primacy on equality, but the basic features of our society and our social structure and our ways of thinking are still very hierarchical. Now, when we look back, I think that uh, democracy developed in India in response to colonial rule. And that's, that in itself is not a bad thing, but we must understand what that really meant for the people who established and developed our democratic ideals and institutions. We developed the argument for democracy before we started building the institutions of democracy. It was not like that in the West. In the West, the two things happened simultaneously. Whereas in India, democracy grew as an argument, as a nationalist argument against colonial rule. We told our colonial rulers, and the colonial rulers were not always unsympathetic to our aspirations. We mustn't forget that uh, the main initiative for the establishment of the Congress Party, the Indian National Congress, which, by the way, is one of the oldest parties in the world. We tend to forget this, that the Indian National Congress was set up in 1885. It is older than the Labour Party of Britain. It is older than the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. It's older than the Chinese Communist Party. And so that planted the seeds of democracy, or that provided us with an argument for democracy to be used against our colonial rulers. And we found it very easy to tell our colonial rulers that uh, you are talking about the virtues of the rule of law, of equality of opportunity, and all these other things which have become established in your own country. But here, you are denying these things to us. And we cannot build democracy in India unless you leave this country. We, we cannot do it. And it was quite easy for the leaders of the nationalist movement to put the colonial administrators on the moral back foot because they had really no answer against this argument that if you really believe in equality and democracy, 
then why don't you leave this country and let us become free? And then we will build democratic institutions. The colonial administrators always pointed out that your country was not as yet ready for democracy. And the nationalist leader said, we cannot become ready for democracy until you leave us. And the colonial rulers told us that India was a society of castes and communities and not a nation of citizens. And we said in response, we may have been a society of castes and communities, but we are ready to become a nation of citizens and we will become a nation of citizens when you leave the shores of this country. I would now very briefly explain what I as a sociologist mean by institutions. And then I will give some ex examples of the way in which the principal institutions of democracy have been functioning in India since the time of independence. Now, you know, sociologists uh, regard the study of institutions as central to their discipline. Unlike economists, the sociologists regard institutions as a, and there are many different kinds of institutions that we study, starting with religious institutions, political institutions, domestic institutions, economic institutions. So we study all these institutions. But what is an institution, you might ask me? Well, there are differences even among sociologists as to what they mean when they talk about institutions. Some mean by an institution an enduring group which has a definite identity and definite boundaries and which outlives the individual members of that institution. Like a school is an institution, a hospital is an institution, a college is an institution because it has a form and a structure which outlives its individual members. As teachers we know that new students come in every year and old students leave. Even teachers retire and new teachers replace them. But the institution of the Delhi School of Economics remains not completely unchanged. It remains the same institution despite the changes that it takes place, that take place. So I think an easy way of defining an institution is to regard it as an enduring group with a definite identity, with definite boundaries, and an identity which endures over time and outlives the coming and going of its individual members. That's one way of defining an institution. I find that the best way of defining it for this particular purpose. There is another way of defining an institution, and that is by regarding it as a recurrent pattern of activities, a regular pattern of activities that is valid, meaningful, and legitimate. For instance, we can regard the school as an institution, but we can also regard education as an institution, the process of education, which has a recurrent and a regular pattern and an enduring quality. We can regard the court as an institution, the court of law as an institution, but we can also regard the judicial process as an institution. We can regard the family as an institution, but we can also regard marriage as an institution. But in either case, the, in either case, we have to make a distinction between the individual and the institution. The institution is something which we have to consider as distinct and having a life of its own independently of its individual members. So now, when I talk about the institution, and there are many different institutions that one can talk of when one talks about the institutions of democracy. No, when one looks at society as a whole, then of course, one can range across a whole range of institutions, religious institutions, economic institutions, institutions of production, uh, domestic institutions, institutions of family, kinship, and marriage, and, of course, political institutions, among which the institutions of democracy are our subject today. What are these political institutions of democracy that are central? I will not try to give you an exhaustive or a complete list, but to give you an illustrative list of what I hope all of you will agree are the central institutions of democracy. Parliament is one of them. And the state legislatures, along with Parliament. If you look at Parliament, you will find 
that it has a continuity. And if you look at the present Lok Sabha, the 15 Lok Sabha, I don't think the 15 Lok Sabha has any member from the first Lok Sabha. First, second, third. There is a regular outflow of people as they are replaced by new people. Then I regard the Supreme Court as an institution. Again, the same thing. The Supreme Court bench remains the Supreme Court bench despite the changes in the judges who occupy that bench at any particular point of time. Then the cabinet is also an institution. And finally, I would like to consider political parties as institutions. As a matter of fact, I'm, 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 I'm trying to write something. I'm trying to write something and I would like to share with you uh, my briefly my ideas about what I'm in the process of writing just now. I'm not myself a political scientist and I have had no training in political science. In fact, I came to sociology. I came to sociology via anthropology. And I came to anthropology via physics and mathematics. So I have no training in political science, but I, I have read and, 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 and published papers and books and I have friends and colleagues and I've spoken at seminars in political science. I think that uh, uh, the uh, uh, people, the political scientists, and they have studied democracies over a long period of time, longer than sociologists have studied any political institutions. And if you look at, I was just checking this with one of my colleagues who is a professor of political science in the JNU, if you look at the work of political scientists on democracy, they classify democracies in different forms, the presidential system, the parliamentary system, this system, that system. And their point of departure, the general point of departure in the classification of democracies is the form of government. What kind of government do they have? The Westminster model or the presidential model of uh, the United States or France the presidential model of the United States is not the same as the presidential model of, of France. But they generally try to classify democracies in terms of the characteristics of the government. My idea, which I am trying out now, is that why don't we begin at the other end? And as an Indian, I feel inclined to do that. Why don't we try to understand democracy by trying to see the variety of forms of opposition, not of government, but of opposition. And the forms of opposition are just as diverse as the forms of government. Now, when we look at all this, I think what one finds, what we find is that democracy everywhere, in democracy everywhere, there is a tension all over the world. Democracy rests on a tension between two different principles. I don't call it a contradiction, but I call it a tension. What are these two different principles? And what is the tension between these two different principles on which democracy and democratic institutions rest everywhere in the world? The first principle is the popular principle, which is the rule of numbers. But the rule of numbers alone does not tell us everything about democracy. There is another principle, which is the principle of the rule of law. The principle of constitution of uh, a legislature in a democracy is different from the principle of constitution of a court. Members of parliament are elected. And the qualifications are basic and minimal. Whereas judges are not elected, they are appointed. And they have to meet many very stringent requirements in order to qualify to be a judge of the Supreme Court or the High Court. The functional difference between what Parliament does, Parliament has to take into account the voice of the people. That is why, that is why it is called a Lok Sabha. It represents the voice of the people and that is extremely important in a democracy. But what is also important in a democracy, that the voice of the people should not be heeded when it demands that something which is completely illegal be done unless the voice of the people is prepared to amend the laws and then do, and then again this law, the amended law, 
can be taken back to the Supreme Court to see whether it is in consistency, in conformity with the basic constitutional principles. So when we think of institutions like Parliament or the Supreme Court or uh, the Cabinet or other political parties, my thought goes back to a splendid book which was written by a journalist, but not by an academic, but which has become a classic. It's a book called The English Constitution by Walter Bajot, who was the first editor of The Economist. Bajot uh, pointed out that, that uh, the English Constitution, he was talking about the English Constitution, this applies to all constitutions, has a dignified part and an efficient part. That is, when we look at any institution, whether it is parliament or the Supreme Court or the University of Delhi, we should try to see whether it works in such a way that the dignity of that institution is upheld. But we must also try to see that it works in such a way that its efficiency is also maintained, not just its dignity. It has to work. I mean, it can't just depend on formal ceremonies at which everybody stands up or sits down according to it has to now if we look at the dignified part of our institutions i think that we will all have to admit that parliament in the last 10 or 15 years has been sadly lacking in upholding its own dignity what about the supreme court i think the supreme court has done much better Supreme Court has done much better, but we should be very careful. And I, I'm, I'm really very, very grateful to Justice Kapadia for having pointed this out. The Supreme Court has done its work, it has done its work well, but we must not expect it to do work which is not its own work. We must not expect it to make pronouncements on areas over which it has no competence and no authority. We must be very, very careful about it. When we look at the Supreme Court, I'm, 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 I'm a great admirer of our courts of justice. It is true that it has maintained its dignity. On the whole, I would say it has maintained. There have been occasional cases of charges of corruption against judges of the Supreme Court, but on the whole, it has maintained its dignity. But what about the efficient part? There, I think we have to be very careful because because if you look at the arrears of cases in the Supreme Court or in the High Courts of Justice, you will be absolutely staggered by the arrears of cases, which is the price which has been paid in order to maintain the dignified part of the Supreme Court. This is very worrying. For me, it is very worrying. Why is it specially worrying for me since I'm a student of inequality? It is very worrying. The law's delay, I'm using a phrase from Shakespeare, the law's delay does not hit everybody equally hard. The law's delay hits the poor and the resourceless much harder than those who have the resources to hire clever lawyers in order to either speed up a hearing or to delay a hearing. You can hire very clever lawyers who will delay. Suppose you feel that the verdict will go against you, you can hire very, very clever lawyers to delay. And this has happened over and over again. Suppose you feel that the verdict is going to go in your favor, you can hire even more clever lawyers to speed up the process. So this is not uh, a very, very satisfactory state of affairs. I will end by turning to one particular institution which is not a part of the Constitution, but which is a very important part of the operation of democracy in this country, and that is the political party. Parties both in office and in opposition. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about the conduct of these parties in Parliament or outside Parliament, but I do want to point out, or at least ask the question, that I have pointed to the fact that members of parliament are elected. 
whereas members of the Supreme Court are appointed. What is the route through which leadership of political parties is acquired? Is it appointment or is it election? And if we look at our political parties, we are struck again and again by the fact that in many cases, and in crucial and decisive cases, it is neither election nor appointment. It is what I, as an anthropologist, call the genealogical route. The genealogical route. That is the route of connection through family and kinship. And it is not true only of what is called the first family in India. You go to the states and you will find this. And this is a very worrying thing, that our political parties do not seem able to replenish themselves except through the genealogical route. And the journalist Inder Malhotra, he's a very senior journalist. In fact, he traveled the country as a reporter from Mr. Nehru's time onwards. He has written a wonderful book. It is called Dynasties of India and Beyond. How the dynastic principle is not simply established, but also acknowledged by many people in India. He starts with the Nehru Gandhi family, which is the first thing to start with. But he says this is not the end of it. He says that in India, it's not just the Nehru Gandhi. There are what he calls midi dynasties and mini dynasties in many of the states and even down to the district level. So this is how our political parties are. And if this is how our political parties operate, then we should be worried about the party, which is an extremely important institution in regulating the relationship between the government and the opposition. And this is true not just in India. This is true. Uh, Indar Malhotra calls it dynasties of India and beyond, and he goes on to Pakistan, he goes on to Bangladesh, to Sri Lanka, to the Philippines, and so on. So I think that uh, when we think about democracy in India, we must think about all these things instead of focusing entirely on the aspirations and ideals of democracy. Those aspirations, uh, we, can, we are very good at talking about those aspirations and ideals. But those aspirations and ideals are not by themselves enough to make the nation move forward along a democratic path. For that, we need to build institutions. Thank you.
Today's uh, discussion will be on governance and delivering governance in the context of growth and development, the twin problems that face our country and affect it profoundly. Why do you think a sociologist should worry about governance at all? You might remember that there was a time when many sociologists, including me, made the point that sociology is an academic discipline and we don't have much to do with social policies. In fact, the moment you tinker with things of that sort, you're automatically undermining the grandeur of the discipline. I believed in that too for a long time, till I began to introspect. And in the process of introspection, I came to the conclusion that if I am quoting Mannheim, Marx, Giddens, Parsons, etc., why do they make sense to me? Why is it that people argue, many of them argue, that sociology is Western discipline and not Indian, and therefore our subservience to these scholars should be snapped forthwith, and we should start with Indian brand of sociology, a more nativistic variety of academic work? But the truth is, as I see it, sociology is very deeply wedded to the notion of citizenship. This is my latest obsession and also my abiding conviction. If you look at the discipline of sociology, you will find that it grew or was born not in the West. Now, that is a very empty kind of statement. Actually, it grew and flourished in all liberal democratic societies. Not just in Western societies, but in liberal democratic societies. And therefore, the concerns of sociology, once one looks at it carefully, at least from my point of view, from the perspective that I exercise, I find that the major problems of sociology are actually problems of liberal democracy. And because we have chosen, <clears throat> in our wisdom, to be a liberal democratic society, howsoever haltingly, howsoever failing, faulty, faultily, nevertheless, we have chosen to be a liberal democratic society, so we better gear up and do our sociology right. What is the most important aspect of a liberal democratic society? The most important aspect of a liberal democratic society is really citizenship. And how do we deliver to citizens? It's not about people. People are everywhere. But citizens are only in liberal democratic societies. Does sociology depend on rich countries to favor it? Not really. There have been many rich countries in this world where there's very little sociological output. Does sociology only need societies where the rule of law prevails? Not quite, because you have societies in this world where there are strict adherence to law, and yet there's no sociology. You have, for example, Singapore, you have the Middle East, you have various other countries that are quite wealthy, much wealthier than India, China, for example. But you don't really have quality output of sociology from these countries. In fact, Indian sociology trumps them all much, much better, more sophisticated, more deep, and more well-researched. Why is this the case? In my view, the real reason why sociology does well in, our, in, in, in countries like India and liberal democratic societies, but from my perspective, sociology is really about four issues in the main. One is about choices, very simple things. The other is about ambitions, then about universality, and about equality. These are the four issues that sociology really deals with, and therefore, it is not at all surprising that sociology should do well and thrive in a liberal democratic society, because this is where these four issues are really regnant and make a lot of sense, and not anywhere else. The democracy is really a tense balance between the rule of law and the rule of numbers. When we see the rule of law and rule of numbers in that kind of tense balance, then we understand that sociology really is about this aspect about, of everyday life, which can only be realized in a liberal democratic society, cannot be realized in a totalitarian society, or shall we say, a society that is rich, or a society that is in the West, a society that has come through a revolution, or whatever. While China, Russia, Cuba all delivered a historic role, we must also admit the fact that they have not really delivered on the sociological front. So it is not just wealth, it is not just rule of law, but it's more than that, it is really about the citizen. 
So when we talk about citizenship, university, universality, equality, individual, and choice, what do we have? We have the individual on the one hand, and you have the collective on the other. And they're both facing each other in a situation of friendship, not of animosity. And it is this conviviality between the individual and the collective that is best captured in a liberal democratic society. And if you are going to be interested in governance in a country like India, this is an area where you must pay attention. So if you're talking about, shall we say, choices, then think of the most important contributions made in this field. You can't help but discuss Talcott Parsons, who, who talk, taught us about the dilemmas of orientation. If you're thinking about ambitions, then you can't help but think of M.N. Srinivas and Sanskritization. You can't help but think of Kingsley Davis. You cannot help but think of Professor Yogendra Singh and his works on modernity. Where's universal, universalism? Can you avoid reading Habermas? You cannot. Can you avoid reading Mannheim? You cannot. Because through Mannheim, you understand what universalism is, what secularism actually means. Because in Mannheim, secularism is not just about rule of law. Secularism is about a rule of law where we are all participating and we are all equals. If a rule of law is given to us from above, it doesn't really matter whether it is God or it is an absolutist state that is dictating terms to us. In both cases, then it's not really secular, no matter what the origin is. So if you're talking about universalism, again, you have sociologists who contribute to it. In other words, I would say that there is no theme in sociology which is of significantly, which has been significantly researched and studied in depth, which is not really liberal democratic in origin. All the major themes, major issues that sociologists wrestle with, they've contributed to, are issues that are liberal democratic in character, and therefore, it is not at all surprising that sociology should do well in such societies. And therefore, because we hope to be a truly flourishing liberal democratic society, we had better gear up and do our sociology right and ask sociology to contribute to this entire process. As of now, we find there are certain things that we have done and done rather well. We have examined, for example, the dynamics of family, the dynamics of rural differences and rural development, and how urban and rural India interact. They're actually within the, in, within the perspective of liberal democracy. Sanskritization, why? Where are we going? What kind of upward mobility is available to us? What are the laws that make it possible for us to, to climb up the ladder? How do we handle these things politically and across different classes and castes? These are liberal democratic issues that if they had not been present in our country, believe me, such studies would not have the resonance that they do have today. So then, what is the ultimate lesson of liberal democracy? The ultimate lesson is the us and the them or the they are not two distinct categories. The they are in us. And this is where I learned about intersubjectivity from many sociological thinkers, and you know all of them. When the, us is, when the, they, when the others are in us, then we begin to understand that if we are favored by certain social conditions, then that, those social conditions should also be spread out to include other people as well. If the, us, if the them in is, in, is in us, then we also realize that the kind of differentiation we make between people, between communities, and between groups are not legitimate at all. They are there, the outcome of our natural, spontaneous, sociological urge, perhaps, but they are not acceptable within a liberal democratic framework which is why we have reservations, which is why we talk in terms of upward mobility, which is why we want to remove all the barriers that have been given to us through history and tradition. So when we see others in ourselves, we realize that the others are not just figures, not just facts, there's much more than that. They're not just numbers. When we look at the growth story in our country today, we are besotted by numbers. We see all these numbers around us and we feel that this is all there is to growth in India. But if you look at growth from a sociological perspective, which is in turn informed by liberal democracy, then those numbers begin to tell us something quite different. Those numbers are fleshed out and you find that there are human beings out there who are actually bearers of these numbers. For example, there has been a great degree of discussion on poverty figures in our country. 
It has ranged from 27% if you believe in the government, which, which fewer and fewer people believe these days. It is 40% if you believe in what late Professor Tendulkar said. It is 50% if you think what N.C. Saxena said was right. And if you really want to go for big hitters, then Professor Anjul Gupta said 77%. So whether it's 27% or 77%, does it really make a difference? You open your window and you see poverty everywhere. So why should we just quibble about numbers? There are human beings out there who are poor. Will it really make a difference but if you get your numbers right? I don't think so. I think there's something else that's happening which we must pay attention to. What else is happening? To give flesh to the numbers, to give substance to the numbers, to give soul to the numbers. We realize, for example, there are very few people in our country today who actually get the proper kind of medical care attention that they need. 37 million people go into poverty every year because of health reasons. Now, that is the kind of statistic that should not be allowed. Why is it that the large number of village poor send their children to private schools? <clears throat> no parent, in my view, should have to make <coughs> such a sacrifice. And yet, when we look at numbers, they're quite interesting. The IT sector, for example, has grown tremendously from roughly 1% in 1990 to 4% in 2004, now it is almost 7% of GDP and contributes roughly 23% of our exports. Now these are huge figures and you and I could easily be swayed by this figure and say India is developing very rapidly. But what about those four things we talked about? Choice, ambition, universality, equality. Are these four issues of liberal democracy, are they being satisfied? Are these four issues that sociology has wrestled with, are they being satisfied? Can sociologists, who also think of these four issues, look at these numbers again, refract them through the prism of these issues, and come up with some other conclusions which are worthwhile, especially in the context of development? And so, we return again to the figures. We return again to the fact that the IT sector is doing so, so brilliantly. And then we look at it carefully, and we realize that the IT sector employs but 3 million people. In fact, the latest economic survey of India was a bit disappointing because the latest economic survey of India said the numbers are roughly 2.5 million. But let us, let us take it at 3 million and let us say that 3 million people have generated jobs for four others, 12 million people in all in a country of 1.2 billion and that's certainly not good enough. Or let us take some other sectors. Where is export really growing? Where is the cutting edge of a growth and development taking place, primarily in the export sector. And in the export sector, who are the people who actually contribute in export? It is very important to realize that. As you may probably know, that between 1995 and 2004, textile exports went up by over 100%. And who are the people who work in the textile sector? Not the spiffy guys you see in the IT sector. These are the very poor, they come from the informal sector, they do not get proper wages, they have no ESI, no provident fund, and they constitute, by the way, 93% of our labor force. We look through the numbers, the numbers tell us something, and yet we feel uncomfortable. So then I say, whenever you're uncomfortable with numbers, employ the smell check. Does it smell right? There's something wrong about the numbers. They're wrong because the four criteria of liberal democracy are not really met with in these numbers. 93% are still in the unorganized labor force. But in the export sector, the textile sector has done very well, has contributed a lot. Some of you know perhaps of Panipat, Tirupur, Muradabad, etc., where you have brassware, you have textiles, you have carpets. Carpets are woven in Banaras, Bhadavai, Jonpur, Mirzapur. I don't know how many of you have been there. But India, till very recently, contributed to 11% of the world's trade in carpets, 11%. 15% of India's export in terms of gems and jewelry, and you know all about that, how they're made, how diamonds are polished. But who talks about that? This senior side of growth is not discussed because the human element, the four aspects of liberal democracy, are not factored in the way they should have been. And that is why you find that the 93% of the unorganized labor force is not taken into account. Who are the, these people? Where are they producing? What kind of production methods are they using? These are also issues that need to be looked into. In 1960, for example, we produced 5 billion square meters of cloth. In 1960, a lot of cloth. But by 2005, we were producing 26 billion square meters of cloth. 26 billion from 5 billion square meters of cloth. 
But 85% of this growth happened in the loom sector and not in the mill sector. If you look at, for example, the distribution of organized and unorganized labor, organized labor force is stubbornly sticking around 27 million. And I'm being very charitable because most people say between 23 million or thereabouts. But let us say 27 million, it's not moving from there. It moved by 0.8 million in the last two years because women entered the workforce. But one way or the other, whichever way you want to position this data, the fact of the matter is only 27 million people are in the organized labor workforce. So this is the way in which we are progressing. This is what we are doing. This is how we're developing. And these, these are the issues that we really need to look at. Why is this growth not translating to development? Why do we still have such a large army of people who are in the unorganized sector? And is it true that the rich and the poor live side by side they need each other, and it is this that leads to growth, and yet we don't pay attention to the other half, or more than the other half, that sustains this growth and this huge success story that India is all about today. I think growth is very important. You cannot develop without growth. You cannot realize the dreams of liberal democracy without growth taking place. You cannot have liberal democracy achieving higher and higher standards in a stagnant economy. It is not possible. Therefore, I do welcome growth. But after that, there's something more that I would like to see. And what I would like to see is the extent to which this growth can translate itself into development and not just remain a numbers game. We don't want our wires crossed. We don't want to be on the same old milk run, doing the same old things. We want to change. We want to develop. We want to progress. Universalism, choice, Ambitions. Look at the ambitions that poor people have. Look at the ambitions that exist in our country. If you go to a village, and most of you have been to villages as field workers, or perhaps some of you even come from rural India. I don't come from rural India, but I've spent many years there, and I can tell you, perhaps because I'm an outsider, such certain things strike me very, very dramatically. You go to a village at 2.33 in the afternoon, a scooter rickshaw turns up, and from that scooter, magic, magically, about 15 children are disgorged, thin, skinny children, dragging their satchels, coming back home from a private school. And this private school is not the specific kind of school that you and I imagine. It's a small little place in a village. As you know, private schools range from 50 rupees a month to 275 rupees a month or whatever. I know of two BPL families, admittedly two, and you'll say, what is two? Two is nothing. But I want to give flesh to numbers. So I know of two BPL families who actually send their children to a private school. As I told you earlier, they've tightened the buckle the belt to such an extent that all that remains is a buckle. Nothing else is there. And this is the kind of tragedy that haunts us. But look at the ambitions. Look at the choices. Look at the thrust for equality. And their hope that a universal system that, 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 that exists in our country through liberal democracy will see these hopes sustained. In 1980, 1980, just the other day, in 1980, 2% of children went to private schools in 1980. In 2008, imagine the figures, 21% of rural children go to private schools. 52% of urban children go to private schools. Why is that so? It's because there is this drive. We want to realize ourselves. We have ambitions. We have choices. Let's make the most of it. And are we making them available to these people? And this is what liberal democracy dream is about. And this is also, by the way, that sociology should be working, and this is also the dream that sociology should also be entertaining. 2%, 1980, 21%, 52%, look at the numbers, staggering, absolutely. If you look at the way in which people treat illnesses, that again is very revealing. 71%, the Indian Human Development Survey says 71% of people, sick people, seek private medical care, whether urban or rural. 17% go to public hospitals. Why is that so? I don't know. All the records say that public hospitals are better endowed, have better doctors, have better equipment, and yet they don't go there. They go to private hospitals, and they go into debt. As I told you earlier, 39 million people go into poverty every year because of this. Today, 27% of the sick in this country do not seek medical care at all because they don't have the money for it. Can you imagine anything more tragic than that? But that is the way it is. And this is something that we have to pay attention to. So what do we do about these things? 
What do we do about figures of poverty? Do we look at figures of poverty simply as poverty figures and leave it at that? Or do we try to see to what extent sociology can contribute towards delivering to people such that the lib that democracy, liberal democracy as we truly know it to be, can be realized? In this context, I have a few suggestions to make. Suggestion number one is that we must be able to look at other people as if they are us. And this is again something that sociology teaches us. And if you say it's not true, I don't agree with you. I've spent 30 years teaching exactly this thing time and time again under different pretexts, that the other is in us. We are not alone, other are, others are in us, and those who we think are far, far away, not at all connected with us, are actually deeply and intimately related to us. So this is something that sociology has taught us again and again, and we must pay attention to this. So then, the second point, which is also very important, that is this, that target approaches to development, to growth, don't really work. Targeted approaches. Why don't they work? Simple sociology will tell you why they don't work. They don't work because they don't involve all of us. Targeted approaches work best when they involve all of us. All development processes work best when they involve all of us. But when they don't involve all of us, it doesn't work. We all know that poor people can't fight for their cause. This is the truth. There's no point romanticizing the poor. They can't do it. They have never done it. There's been no society in the world where the poor have actually led a revolution. Other people have led revolutions for the poor. The poor have not. How can they? When I was studying the Bharatiya Kisan Union in West UP, Mahindra Singh Tikai, he's passed away now, Mahindra Singh Tikai told me that he had gone to Palamau in what is now Jharkhand. And he talked to them about how important it was to form a farmer's union that would be nationwide in scope. And he talked to them and he talked to them and he said that somehow they weren't listening to me. And I didn't know what was wrong, where was I going wrong. And then when I left the village, I turned back to look at the village, it was enveloped in blackness. It was not there. There was no light. There was no food. Then he said to me, how can you imagine that these people would ever join a movement like ours? They don't have the time, they don't have the money, they don't have food in the kitchen to go on dharna one for one month outside the district magistrate's office. If you're going to do something for the poor, remember, it is not philanthropy you're doing, it is part of your duty as a, as a, as a bearer of liberal democracy and the traditions of liberal democracy. So after all, when we talk about reservations, for example, are we doing philanthropy? Why, do we, why are we so in, involved in reservations? Why do we think this is an important part of, of liberal democracy? Why is it that, liberal, that reservation, for example, carries all these four qualities I mentioned to you, the individual qualities and the collective qualities? Why? Because through reservation, we hope to raise the pool of talent which is existing in society such that all of us benefit and all of us prosper. It's not just for this or that section, it is for everybody. And that is why reservations make so much sense to, to our society. At the same time, if we talk about universal health and universal education, that again works. If it's targeted, then you will always have health for the poor, which will be poor health. You'll have health, education for the poor, which will end up as poor education. And that is the truth of the matter. Why is it so? Because people who count, who can make a difference, and who can make a noise are not involved in this process. If you look at the Rashtra Swastha Bhima Yojana, and I've studied that to some length in Northwest India, primarily Haryana, you'll find again that this Rashtra Swastha Bhima Yojana looks very good, but because it is aimed for the poor, can only help the poor, can only give you 30,000 rupees per year, and only for five people in a family, if you have a sixth person in the family, you wish that person were dead, this is not good enough. And therefore, it does not work. So all these policies, which are targeted policies, meant only for a target group, don't work like they should work. Besides, if you say 40% of India is poor, 50% of India is poor, or 77% is poor, where is the target? It's almost the entire society. So how can you have a targeted approach where the entire society is involved? And by the way, let me also discuss another issue with you, and that is this that liberal democracy doesn't wait, wait for wealth or prosperity to deliver to citizens. It does not wait. If you look at the history of liberal democracy, you'll find that some of the most glorious advances in society were made 
when those societies were actually quite poor. We think of Sweden today as, a, as the exemplar of social democracy, of social service. But remember, when Sweden started the Falkenheimet program in 1932, it was desperately poor. The unemployment rate was 25%. Over a million people left Sweden for, 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 for United States because they couldn't get a job and they couldn't get food to eat at that time. When they were so poor, they thought of this social service program, which later on grew into what it is today. They did not say, we are poor, let us wait. They said, we are poor, but we have citizens, and we must look after citizens. So Falkenheimet program is a program which makes the country like a home. The people are people of our home. And that is what it was all about. Likewise, you look at the way in which the social service program grew in Canada. It grew in Winnipeg, which was very, very poor during the war and treated very badly by the war, and that is where it grew. The Basque part of Spain died there again. Britain in 1946, after the war, Britain was so poor and so miserable and so wretched, it could not even hang on to India. And that's when it started the National Health Service Program. If you think again, a little further back in history, you will find that Bismarck did some Wonderful thing, though he's a man we love to hate. Again, he made interventions when Germany was going through a crisis. France, Third Republic, a crisis. That is when things happen, and it happened because they believe in liberal democracy. They believe that our collective wealth and our individual wealth, our collective well-being and our individual well-being are very closely and intricately related. It is this conviction that then spurs people to act the way they have acted. And when sociology is on their side, if they have sociology as their handmaiden, as their tool, then this task gets done better because sociology can remove a large number of misconceptions. Sociology can put flesh to numbers. Sociology can also tell you how relevant it is to balance the rule of law, the rule of numbers, the individual and the collective, and also point out that if you're really thinking about ethics, remember, other people count. And this is the example that we have learned from Western, uh, Western philosophy and Western sociology. But think of it from the Indian point of view. All these issues I mentioned to you just now, you find resonance of that, you find reflections of that in Indian sociology. Indian sociologists have struggled with similar ideas and similar issues. Perhaps not always keeping in mind the fact that they are actually putting in their best in making liberal democracy come to life. But if we do it self-consciously, and if we do it diligently enough, and we do it all the time without fail, then I'm sure sociology can deliver more than any other discipline I can think of. And I therefore feel that those of us who are young and those of us who have a life ahead of them and a wonderful life ahead of them, you can make it better and more worthwhile by just doing good sociology, because then you'll be doing good liberal democracy, and by that, you'll be delivering to citizens the way they should be delivered and looked after. Thank you very much.